What's going on, Discover Point? It is so good to see everyone. So glad to have you guys hanging out with us in person and online. I want to welcome all of our guests that are here with us this morning. Church, can we put our hands together for all of our guests right now? So glad to have you guys with us. Well, about 100 years ago, there was these two English ornithologists. Anyone know what an ornithologist is? Anyone? A couple, couple people, okay? If you don't learn anything else today, you're going to learn a new word. Ornithology is the study and science of birds. And so these two English ornithologists, they love to study birds, and they were trying to figure out if birds uh, could find their way back home. And so they did this study, and what they did is they distributed birds throughout the world and in different countries. And there was one bird in particular that they took all the way down to Venice and come to find out, it only took them about 341 hours to fly all the way back home and, and to find his nest. And, and so, you know, the scientists were blown away by this whole experiment. And so they just started to distribute birds, you know, in greater distances. And, and they took two birds and they flew them across the Atlantic Ocean and left them in Boston. They released them in Boston, Massachusetts. One of the birds died. But the other bird ended up finding his way back home after flying 12 hours or 12 days and 12 hours. What the scientists discovered, these ornithologists discovered, is that these birds were wired to find their way back home. Today we're going to look at a story about a young man who found his way back home. He had gotten off track in his life, but he found his way back home. And that story is none other than the prodigal son story. Many of you guys have probably heard about the prodigal son story. If you haven't, you're gonna, we're going to dive deeper into it in just a few moments. But basically, this is one of the most popular parables that Jesus ever told. There's been a lot of artwork created. As a matter of fact, Charles Dickens, the, uh, the, the great storyteller, said that the parable of the prodigal son was, without a doubt, the best short story ever told. And it's about this young man who wastes his life but ends up coming back home. And that's where we get the word prodigal. It means reckless. It means wasteful. And so we kicked off last week in this series of Welcome Home, starting from Luke 15. And, and it was important for us to read the first couple verses of Luke 15 because it kind of sets the stage for the context of the prodigal son's story. And so we're going to pick it up from verse 1. It says this, that all the tax collectors and, and sinners were approaching to listen to him, speaking of Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable. So just to kind of recap last week, if you missed last week, you go back and watch it online. But essentially there's these tax collectors and these sinners that come to eat dinner with Jesus. And he sits down with them. And we, we heard a lot about the context last week, why that was such a big deal, because the Pharisees, these religious people, they were upset that these sinners were sitting down with Jesus because in that time period, if you sat down with somebody, it literally meant that you accepted them, that they were welcomed, that they belonged. And so Jesus sitting down with these sinners was a huge deal. And the Pharisees didn't like that because to, for them to sit down with a sinner literally meant that they were defiling themselves, that they were sinning against God. And so Jesus, knowing this, knowing that this troubled the, the religious elite, he begins to tell them some stories known as parables. He tells them a couple stories. We, we heard about the, the parable of the lost sheep, and then we heard about the parable of the lost coin and, and what that represents, that is God's heart pursuing the lost. But then Jesus transi transitions into this last parable. And there's a lot that we could glean from. Again, this story is one of the most popular stories, but there's so much to glean from this story about the, about the, predic the, prodigal, uh, uh, the prodigal son. And so he picks up a couple verses later, in verse 11, and he said this, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. And so he distributed the assets to them. So the man had two sons. The first son, the younger son that we we're going to discuss today, literally represents 
the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus was sitting with. And we're going to learn about the elder son in a couple weeks, but the elder son represents the Pharisees that Jesus is also talking to. But let's camp out on the prodigal son. So this young son comes to his father, and he says, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So think about this, okay? In in Mosaic law, whenever there was two sons, okay, the, 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 the oldest son always got a double portion of the inheritance, right? If there were two sons, then essentially the, the, uh, the inheritance was uh, 67% of the inheritance would go to the oldest son and 33% would go to the youngest son. And so this younger son is essentially saying, hey, I want my 33% share right now. Now, obviously that sounds selfish, right? Even in our modern day culture. But to the Jewish audience, I want, to, I want you to keep this in mind. To the Jewish audience, man, this whole story is blasphemous in so many ways. It's so disrespectful in so many ways. Because essentially what the younger son is saying, listen, dad, I want, I, you know, I don't really care about our relationship. I, I want my money now. And, and essentially he was saying, hey, you're dead to me. In a culture that was built on the Ten Commandments, where you honor your father and mother, right? Like, this was a huge no-no for this younger son to say this. So much so that if this really did take place, the father would have had every right to disown his son. He would have publicly humiliated him, and in some cases, according to the law, he could have even had him sentenced to death by stoning The younger son doesn't care about honoring his father whatsoever. All he cares about is getting what's his, right? And so he disrespects his father, and he makes this request. Dad, I want my share of the inheritance now. And and it's not like he's asking, like, you know, um, I I want the house, I want the cars. Like, you know, he, he essentially, he wants to, you know, collect the cash. He wants to get everything that's coming to him so that he could turn that into liquid cash, okay? He wants to take out all of his money that is supposed to come to him in the future, but he wants it now. So that begs the question as to why. Why is the younger son wanting his inheritance now? Now, let me propose something to you. The reason why he was making this request is because he was pursuing his own happiness. He was pursuing his own happiness. Think about that. Like, he he didn't think that living, you know, in his father's house would bring him happiness, and he thought that doing things his way is what would make him happy. It was the pursuit of happiness that made him dishonor his father and go ahead and ask for his inheritance. The pursuit of happiness. I mean, listen, everybody just wants happiness, right? And so many times, though, a lot of us who can identify with the younger son, we are just like him in that we want to do things our way because we feel that our way is the best way to live, and so that's the way that we're going to live happy for the rest of our lives. Blaise Pascal, he he was a a famous philosopher. He said this. He said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both attended with different views. All men seek happiness, right? We do things selfishly because why? It's about what makes us happy. All of us have a little bit of the prodigal son, the rebelliousness of the prodigal son inside of us. We want to do things our way because our way, we feel, is the best way because ultimately it's about my happiness. You guys following me, right? It's about my happiness. And see, here's what you need to understand. Listen, seeking happiness is not necessarily sinful, right? God created us to enjoy all these blessings and the gifts of life and and, and everything like that. But here's where it goes south in our lives. It's when we begin to pursue the things that we think are going to make us happy apart from God. You understand what I'm saying? 
Happiness is not necessarily sinful. It's what we do to make us happy that makes things sinful or not. C.S. Lewis said it like this, all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. Sin is really the pursuit of happiness apart from God. And that's where we find this prodigal son who says, you know what, I don't want the blessings of my father's house. I want to do things my way because my way is way better than any other way because that's what's going to make me happy. So the father honors his son's request to the dismay of the Jewish audience. They couldn't believe that the, the father in this story gives the young rebellious son what he wants. And it says this in verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country. Now listen to this. He travels to a distant country. Again, the Jewish audience listening to this, they realize that the distant country that the young man goes to is a far land, a Gentile land. Anyone in, that, in the Jewish culture that was not a Jew, that didn't follow Mosaic laws, they were considered Gentiles. They were considered pagan worshipers. They worshiped other gods, false gods, and they, they weren't considered clean, right? Because they didn't eat the same type of food. And so, again, the Jewish audience is hearing that this young man, not only did he dishonor his father, but then he goes to a distant country. And so now he's like dishonoring his heritage. He's dishonoring his values, his faith. He's leaving everything. He's going to Las Vegas. He wants to live it up. And it goes on to say, he goes to this distant country where he squandered. That word squandered literally means to like throw wheat in the air and, and let the wind separate the, the shaft from the, 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 the wheat. And so it's like he's just wasting money, man. He's just, he's just flinging dollar bills. He's just, he is living it up. Whatever money he made, he is just wasting it. He's partying. He's living an extravagant lifestyle. He's probably with women, and, you know, he's just having a great old time, wasting his money. So check this out. It says, after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. He wasted everything, right? Right? Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. So he wastes all of his money, and all of a sudden, a famine comes into the land. And now he's stuck. He doesn't have a job, he doesn't have a family, he has no food. And so he gets really desperate, right? And it says that he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the, to his fields to feed pigs. So, so check this out, okay? Again, Jewish audience, right? They're hearing all this. And so here's another red flag for them. This young Jewish boy is going to, he's so desperate that he goes to work for a pig farmer. Okay, so check this out. Now, you know, in, in Western society, man, we love pigs, right? We, we love, like, pork. Some of y'all like pig feet. I don't understand that. That's disgusting. I remember going into the gas station and seeing pig's feet in a jar. Someone explained that to me because it looks disgusting. Some of y'all like the pig ears, you know? All right, I could do the, you know, I could do the stuff on the back, you know, baby at grip. I could do all that. Pig ears, pig feet. I don't know about all that, right? But listen, it's acceptable in our days, right? Pigs are, are part of our society. But back then, again, and even nowadays, right, pigs are considered un, unclean, right? That's why there's, there's food that's kosher. And so this young man, he finds himself, okay? I want you to get this picture. He's in a desperate place. And he finds himself tending to pigs. And I wonder if in that moment, as he's tending to pigs, if he thought to himself, how did I ever get here? Right? Like, I'm sure that he had plenty of time to think and process as Porky was running around him. Right? And he's probably thinking to himself, like, 
this is not the way I expected my life to go. I just wanted to be happy. I mean, it was fun while it lasted. And listen to me, okay? Here's what you need to understand is that sin always takes us further than we want to go. Young people, please hear me, okay? Sin will always take us further than we want to go. The thing about sin, the thing about living lives for ourselves, the thing about rebelling against God's ways is that, yes, man, this seems great in the moment, right? Like, we're living it up. We're having a great time. But at some point, it leaves us in a pig pen. This is why Scripture says that the pleasures of sin, right? Moses said that, 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 that sin is pleasurable, right? He calls it the pleasures of sin. Sin is fun. It's great. It makes us happy. It's, it's awesome. But then it goes on to say, the pleasures of sin only last for a moment. They only last for a moment. And this is exactly what happened to the prodigal son, man. He's living it up. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And unfortunately, he finds himself on the streets in Vegas. And he realizes, like, what have I done? He's hanging out with the pigs. See, it, 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 the, the fact of the matter is, is that so many of us, guys, we, we pursue things that we think are going to make us happy, but in the end, they leave us hanging out with the pigs. For some of us, that's that relationship. For some of us, it's the pursuit of wealth in an unhealthy way, you know? For some of us, we think that, that, you know, we may be married and we think that this other person is going to make us happy. Or we think that, you know, hey, man, if I just, it's okay if I party and I get drunk and everything, it's, it's all about happiness. And, and we just, and we live in that cycle. But at some point, there are consequences that will catch up to us and we end up in a pig pen. And we end up holding the pig. Listen, maybe if you're not a follower of Jesus today, maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you've made some bad decisions and you find yourself in this distant country hanging out with the pigs and life is not the way you thought it would go. Or maybe you're, you are a follower of Jesus and you, you love Jesus, but maybe you've been compromising. You've been compromising and, and maybe giving in to temptation, going into places or doing things that you, you normally wouldn't do because of you're trying to find happiness. You're trying to cope. You're trying to, to you know, uh, just live life according to your own standards. But you're realizing, man, it's just brought you to this place of desperation. Because that's exactly what sin does. It feels great. It's good. It's awesome but it always takes you down the path that you don't want to go. So check this out. He's sitting in the pig pen, and he, he's hungry, and he, he sees the pigs eating, these little, they're called pig pods, and, and, he's eating, and, and the pigs are eating this food, and he, he says to himself, he's like, man, I'm so hungry, I could eat one of those things. And he realizes, okay, he, he comes to that moment of, what am I doing? And he says this, it says in verse 17, it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. He comes to his senses, like he wakes up and he's like, holy cow, everything that I thought I wanted has left me like this and everything that I really need is back in my father's house. Don't miss this. He's hungry and he says, my father's servants are eating better than me. Meaning this, that true satisfaction is only found in our father's house. You need to understand this. See, this is the, the, the enemy doesn't want you to believe this. He wants you to think that Christianity is boring, that, that God is this taskmaster, all this stuff. And no, can it be uh, farther from the truth? See, true satisfaction. This is, this is something that the world can't offer. The world can offer temporary happiness, but it can never all, 
never offer ultimate satisfaction, right? And so he realizes in this moment that he's hungry and that what his father, father's house had is what he needed all along. True satisfaction is found in his father's house. I love what David said in Psalms 36. Listen to this. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of delights. See, Jesus came to satisfy our souls. And when we are most satisfied in God, we have everything we need. And we realize that the things of this world, they can't compare with what's in our Father's house. It doesn't matter if it's status, success, if it's a relationship, like it can't compare with what our Father offers us. And that's where he comes to his senses. He's like, man, this is not the life that I wanted to live. And he comes to his senses and, and he goes back and he, and he comes up with this plan and, and it says this in, in, in Luke 15, verse 18, he goes on to say, it says this, when he came to his senses, or I'm sorry, in verse 18, he says, I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. He comes to his senses and he has this moment of going, I have messed up. And th this is actually a sign of what theologians call repentance. It's this word that literally means to change your mind. Like you view things one way and you change your mind. The Greek word behind it has this idea of a ship changing course. It's going one direction and it starts to change course. And, and scripture talks about repentance, right? And to have a relationship with God means to repent, means you view things one way. You viewed your life in a certain light. You viewed your ways as being the right way to live. You viewed happiness like this, but now you realize this is not the right way. And so repentance means to change your mind of how you viewed your life and how you viewed your relationship with God and what you viewed about God. And it literally means to change your mind and set your mind on the truth of who God is and what he's done for you. And that's the moment that he comes to where he comes to his senses and he, and he says, I'll go to my father and tell him I've sinned. It's a moment of repentance, of changing his mind, what he believed about his sin, about his life, and, and, and realizing that his father was so good and kind and compassionate. He, everything he needs is right here. It's a moment of repentance. And, and listen, my concern is that it's in our churches nowadays, especially in our American culture, we have so many people that want the blessings of the Father, but have never experienced the brokenness to have that relationship. And what I mean by this is that there's so many people that, guess what, they want to continue to live life on their own terms. They want to do things their way, but still take a little pieces of food from the Father's house. And it doesn't work like that. This is why we have so many cultural Christians that are like, man, they go to church, they play the game, but they've never truly said, hey, Jesus, you are my satisfaction. I'm living for you. I want you to live through me. They've never experienced that moment of changing, of repenting, and truly trusting in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And friends, listen, you can't experience the blessings of God without that brokenness, without coming to yourself. And I don't care if you've grown up in church or if this is your first time. The way to have a relationship with God is not by works, it's not by anything, but it's realizing that you needed a father who loved you, who sent his son to die for you. And repenting to change your ways, to change your thoughts about sin and how you've lived your life and to turn towards him and experience grace and mercy in your lives and so he comes to that moment and it says that he got up and he went to his father but while the sun the sun was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion his father saw him and was filled with compassion now think about that statement See, many, many of us 
we've been running from God because we think God is angry with us, that he won't accept us. And we learned last week that Jesus welcomes us to the table. And this is such a beautiful picture of the Father that he's constantly pursuing you, right? He, he's, he, he sees his son, and listen to this. He was filled with compassion. And he ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The Jewish audience at this time, they would have heard this, and they would have been blown away like, no way. There's no way that this father would have shown so much grace and compassion to this rebellious son. But see, again, Jesus is showing us a picture of the father's heart who pursues you and me. And today, listen, if you are not a believer in Jesus, if you have been running and you have found yourself in the pig pen, maybe you're watching online, you just happen to tune in today, and that's, your, and that's where you found yourself, I want you to know that your Father has compassion on you, that today he's running towards you. If you're here today, you stepped into this service today thinking that your life is in ruins, that there's no hope for you, and I want you to know your Father has compassion on you, and he's running towards you. He's not standing there in judgment or in anger. No, he is broken, and he's calling you home. In that culture, fathers, you know, were very is a very patriarchal society, right? And 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 you know, the the, the fathers, the, the patriarchs of the home were were supposed to carry themselves in a dignified manner, so much so that they would never run. And this word "run" in the Greek literally means like a sprint, a marathon, right? And, and, and in order for a, this elderly gentleman, patriarch of the family, to run, he would have had to pick up his toga. You know what I'm saying? Because they, you know, you know, they, they wore those togas back then. He would have had to pick it up in order to run, which is a no-no in that society. The Jewish audience, again, they would have been like, what? Because it literally meant like he was becoming undignified. He was humiliating himself to run to his son. And see, that is the scandal of the cross. That's the scandal of the good news that we did not come after God, that he came after us, that he pursued us. He first loved us, even when we didn't deserve it. Listen, the prodigal son didn't deserve this kind of grace, this kind of compassion, this kind of mercy. Just like you and me. We don't deserve it. But the father pursues us. He humbles himself to pursue you and me. He's running towards his son. <laughs> Check this out. The son said to him as, he, as, he, as he's embraced by his father, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And so here the, the prodigal is in this moment of repenting and he's telling his dad everything he's done and trying to get things right. And listen, the, the, the father cuts him off and, and all of a sudden he says, the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to celebrate. He completely cuts off his son. And just think about the imagery again. The son who is hungry, who left his father's house, he left the abundance of his father's house, who ends up in the pig pen, who's hungry, is now offered a feast. His father is reminding him, hey, I can satisfy you. Everything you need is right here. Listen, I know what you've done. You're forgiven. You're my son now. You, you've always been my son. And you belong here. You belong at this table. And so he throws him this feast. And friends, listen. And our worship team's getting ready to join us. We're getting ready to close out here in just a second. But friends, listen. I don't know who you are today. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe, maybe you've been running from God. Maybe you are a believer and you've just been compromising, man. You've been struggling and you have found yourself in this place. And I feel like with this message today is a reminder that you have everything that you need in your father's house. 
And he's pursuing you today to offer the greatest gift, which is himself and all the blessings that come with him. In just a moment, we're going to respond and we're going to have a time of response. And so what's your, what's your next step today? That's really what this boils down to for you. For you and me, those of you joining online, don't tune out just yet. What's your next step? For some of us, this is a call from your father who's pursuing you. Maybe you've never had a true relationship with Jesus. And you've been trying to do things on your own terms. You've been trying to, to live life on your own terms. And today, your father is calling out to you. And if that's you, man, we want to give you the opportunity to know Jesus. For some of you, maybe you are a believer and you've just been struggling. You've been going through a hard time. You've been compromising. And your father's reminding you, hey, you're my son. You're my daughter. Listen, I have everything that you need right here. I'm just going to ask every head bowed and I close right now. If you're here today, and you're like, David, man, I, I'm like that prodigal son. I, I have tried to live life on my own terms, and I want to just get things right today. I know the Father's pursuing me, and, and I'm ready to just give my life to him. If that's you, I want you to just say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I repent. I'm sorry for doing things that I thought would bring me happiness. I realize that I need you today. You're all that I need. Right now, I just give you my life. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching with us today. We hope this message connected with you. If you made a decision for Jesus today, we'd like to celebrate that decision with you and help you in your next step of life change in Christ. Text DP Follow to 94000 and fill out the form. Be sure to watch next week as we continue in our series called Welcome Home. Have a great week.